<laughs> this is the story of how I lost and then found my gold. My gold being my whole true self in all my strengths and all my challenges. Look at this photo. What do you see? A child dressed as an 80s curtain rail? <laughs> Look at this effervescent, sparkly me. Here I was, channeling my inner Dolly Parton and being myself on purpose. But even aged eight, my gold was getting buried. My dad said it was probably under other layers of things I might think about myself. I imagine the Earth's crust and an icky mantle and a golden core at my center. I imagine that this core was like liquid honey, and this was the honey in my soul. This helped me to believe that there could be gold, but the gold kept getting buried. I came back to this photo many years later, having burnt out of a career in education and school leadership. Rather than appreciate this beautiful child, all I could do was criticize and nitpick. Why? It felt like a mystery. I later learned that this was a traumatized response, but that didn't make any sense. I hadn't experienced childhood trauma. And then I retrained as a coach. And in coach training, at the end of it, we had to give each other feedback. Lots of nice fluff about being a great coach, which I instantly dismissed. And one thing that we could do for our own benefit to change things. All 16 participants independently wrote the same thing about me. You should be kinder to yourself. Ugh. <laughs> my response in my head, what is wrong? With you? Why can't you be kind to yourself? You are going to have to try harder at this. Kind, right? I had a long way to go. But I did get curious. I did think, well, why is it so hard? And eventually, I learnt, age 40, that I have ADHD. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Not a sexy label, let's be honest, <laughs> and not an entirely accurate one either. It's not a deficit of attention. It's brains wired for interest. And when we don't get enough interest, we struggle to pay attention. When I work with my brain, it is definitely not a disorder. It's a difference. But I hadn't been working with my brain for 40 years because I hadn't understood how it worked. I hadn't understood myself. We learn who we are from other people. Children with ADHD, it's thought, receive up to 80% more criticism than the average child. 80% more. By age 12, an ADHD child may have received up to 200,000 more negative comments than the average child. So small trauma leads to big trauma. I had internalized wrong, and I was constantly rescuing myself from wrong with what I now refer to as my wheel of doom, a bit like, you know, when you're waiting for the computer to load and that horrible wheel comes up, my wheel said, do better, be better, try harder. Do better, be better, try harder. Over and over and over. Constant focus on improvement buries our gold. Oh. Like Many other neurodistinct brains, autistics, dyspraxics, dyslexics, ADHDers, Tourette's, or more likely a combination of, I have spiky strengths and spiky challenges. 
My verbal skills are high, and my memory and my processing is under average. At school, I tried to fly in a range of subjects where you had to prove yourself with written work in order to show that you were intelligent. I worked really, really hard, usually at home, to compensate. But in fortnightly PSHE debates, I would come alive. At A-level, one teacher said, you should go to Cambridge. And then she saw my exam results. As a deputy head teacher, I was a specialist thinker. I was a learning specialist, trying and failing to be an all-rounder because my employers had decided that was the only way to become a head teacher. Constant frustration buries our gold. Sometimes our gold is so buried that we don't even believe people when they point out what's good about us. Sometimes I have ADHD clients now who assume that everyone can do what they can do. But this is not true because our spiky strengths are just as spiky as our challenges. My strengths I mean I talk a lot. Uh, <laughs> I'm good at languages. My strengths mean that I'm an intuitive learner. I'm able to think about barriers to learning and ways around it, which helps in education and definitely helps as a coach and trainer now. My ADHD strengths mean that I thrive in challenge and get very focused in a crisis, which help me to lead schools in trouble and definitely helps me to parent children on the onset of puberty. My ADHD strengths mean I'm a creative, big picture thinker, and I'm bold and innovative, constantly looking for new ways to do things. Sometimes these strengths are unusual, so they get policed. I was described by a group of white, male, heteronormative senior leaders as, great, but you've got to rein her in. Rein her in. <laughs> Misogyny, like racism and homophobia, buries our gold. This psychological model really struck a chord for me. The more that we internalize wrong, the more our layer of shame of who we're scared we are builds and builds. And we pretend to be something that we're not. So we get further and further away from that golden core. For me, learning about executive functions of the brain helped me to bust my shame layer and fear. We all have executive functions in our brain, and some of us have up to a 30% impairment. Executive functions help us to organize, prioritize, get started, focus, shift focus, manage our attention and our energy and effort, manage our emotions and regulate, process information efficiently, memorize, monitor our actions. Pretty helpful and very frustrating if you don't know why things are harder for you. But it was learning about my executive function challenges that helped me to reauthor some of life's mysteries through a very different kinder lens, finally. My critical voice had started in secondary school. I used to sit at the back of the class appraising my teachers. I know, who doesn't want one of those in their class? But it wasn't because I was arrogant or mean. It was because I was desperately trying to pay attention and stay focused in the room when they wouldn't let me move and the behavior wasn't spicy enough. When I had a tantrum, full-blown, on the kitchen floor, age 16, it wasn't because I was a spoiled brat or a drama queen. It's because I'd just done an exam. And in that exam, my speedy brain had rushed past the instructions, and the fear of failure had hit me like a tsunami. When I had a boyfriend as a teenager who I got together with and then split up from over and over and over again, it wasn't because I was an inherently bad person. It's because 
unlike the pretending that I was very mature, I was actually behind my peers emotionally. My brain is wired for interest, so I loved the thrill of the chase and then got bored and uh, trapped very quickly. In an interview, when I was told that my body language, which was slumped, did not match my enthusiastic words, it was not because I wasn't up to the job or I was lying. It was because, actually, I was managing my energy badly in a two-day marathon interview process, which is apparently in education the only way to appoint leaders. <laughs> Once we get clear on our strengths and we get clear on our challenges, we can start thinking about our needs. Because we never had imposter syndrome anyway, just a need to be empowered to understand our differences. Now, when I'm looking for the keys in the fridge, or I'm reporting the lost bank card for the third time in two weeks, I don't say, what is wrong with you? I say, hey, look what you are doing. Look who you are being. Let's figure out a way around this. Thank goodness for Apple Pay. <laughs> when I have asked for, uh, when I'm asked to do chapter edits for a book uh, that I've, uh, I've written a chapter for, I say yes, but let's do this verbally so that you can get the best of my brain. When I'm honored to be invited to a TED talk, I say yes, but here's my reasonable adjustments just in case. Dolly Parton said, learn who you are and do it on purpose. So that's what I started to do. But the world wasn't quite ready for me yet. People would unintentionally gaslight. No, you don't have ADHD. We all get distracted. Sometimes I got all out tragedy. Oh, Katie. <laughs> when I was in the office, of a pediatrician trying to get my son diagnosed. She said, I don't like to diagnose ADHD because people judge and he might not get certain jobs. What I will give him is anxiety. And she did. <laughs> when I said, um, <clears throat> I have ADHD, she said, did you fill in the forms yourself or did you do that with your husband? For the first time ever, I realized I wasn't the problem. I wasn't wrong. People's views of, def of difference was the problem. It was as if they had difference as deficit disorder. Let's diagnose it, DDD. <laughs> well, where does it come from? because we all have it. It comes from the systems that we're in. It comes from frameworks like school systems, which frame us in deficit. What's wrong with you? What can't you do? What do we need to improve to get you to the line, to get you to average, uh, even better if? The medical system asks, what is wrong with you and how can we fix you and get you to average? Performative work cultures, in order to keep you on your toes and working hard, ask, what do you need to do to be even better, constantly working? But it's hard to see your gold in these scarcity frameworks. So let's break out. <laughs> we all have strengths. Let's focus on what we're good at and pay attention to our strengths. Because if we do, we leverage so much more well-being and productivity. This is even more true for those of us with the spiky strengths and the spiky challenges, the one in five of us who are neurodistinct. So let's get clear on our strengths clear on our challenges and our needs. And let's shame bust these scarcity frameworks around us. Then 
we can all be our true gold selves on purpose. Thank you.